true. <laughs> Gelong Tipton, it's so wonderful to have you on Happy Place. Thank you for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure. I have so many questions to ask you. I'm not even sure where to begin. Um, but I, I am going to start by thanking you for writing such a beautiful book. I loved reading Amongst Guide to Happiness. I found it extremely comforting, I think, at a time when most of us feel pretty stressed out. So thank you, first of all. Oh, you're welcome. I'm really glad you liked it. I did. I loved it. And, you know, I, I guess it's nice to give everybody the backstory. But I reached out to you on Instagram after I'd read it. My, my brother-in-law actually posted me the book, knowing that it would be right up my street. And I was like, we need to have a chat. I mean, I, you don't need to have a chat with me, but I need to have a chat with you big time because there, there were just so many points. I dogged so many pages of the book and underlined so many bits. And I guess let's start at the beginning of the book where you start to kind of unpick happiness for us. And obviously that's a subject matter that I'm um, very curious about, hence the name of the podcast, um, Happy Place, which can at times be, I guess, a little bit loaded because I don't necessarily align with the thinking that, you know, happiness is a destination. It's something that you, you arrive at down the line, but I find it really interesting to, to look at it and, and work out, I guess at the moment, why so many of us feel not very happy at all. You know, often we'll blame circumstance, but, but it goes much deeper than that. Right. Yeah. I think, I think the, the basic, problem is that we we're all caught up in a in a endless search that that search for happiness um that's the problem because searching creates more searching and any anything we we um any kind of habit we we follow just builds more of itself so if we're always searching for something we're going to be always searching for something so whatever happens is never good enough and of course this is the kind of cycle we're all trapped in and this is the cycle that um the, the advertising industry loves about us, that they can manipulate that in us, the fact that we're never satisfied. You know, we get something and then we want something else. So I think the problem is, is that the more we're looking for something outside of ourselves, the more endless that hunger becomes and we never, we never find any kind of satisfaction. Yeah, it's, it, it goes to the next level, doesn't it? A sort of craving. And it's a real subterranean level of craving where you're not even aware of what you want or how you might get it or what you'll feel like after you've you know attained it but it's just that sort of deep craving that i think most of us have felt especially during the last year where we feel probably more lacking than than we ever have um and it is like you say it's it's totally endless and, and you describe happiness in the book as freedom and again that is something that we just feel that we have our freedom stripped from us right now because there's so many rules and regulations and things that we can't do which previously were completely normal for us like having friends to our home seeing family etc but it's not impossible to feel freedom at this point you know you you demonstrate that in the book so how can we cultivate more of a an internal or a mental freedom when there are so many outside of exterior restrictions in place yeah i think you've nailed it by saying the word inter internal or interior freedom mental freedom because what kind of freedom are we talking about and yes it's true that on in this last year it's been very very difficult for all of us because all of the things that we depend upon or most of the things we depend upon for happiness have become uh, taken they've been taken away from us and so all the building blocks that we use for our support have gone and we're backed into a corner just with ourselves and with our stress and I think the kind of freedom I'm talking about which is obviously connected with the the message of the book which is meditation is can we free our minds from that endless hunger and can we free our minds from all of the negative painful um, emotions and thoughts that drag us down I, I don't mean we should have no thoughts or emotions I just mean can we be less controlled by our own stress and our own dissatisfaction these are states of mind and we can change them yeah I mean this is again a huge takeaway from the book that we have so much more agency over all of that than we believe you know we we often feel like we are our emotions and that our thoughts are fact always you know our, our brains are kind of constantly ruminating on worries problems lacking and, and we end up feeling that it's all absolutely true and you're saying in the book that 
you know, one of the biggest benefits of meditation is the relationship that we can cultivate with our emotions and thoughts, rather than thinking they're fact, they're there, they're part of us. It's having a, a different dynamic with them. Is, is that the right way of articulating it? Absolutely. And that's the key. It's the relationship. We do have a relationship with our thoughts because we're thinking those thoughts and we're feeling those feelings. So what is that part of ourself that knows how we're feeling? You know, if we're upset or we're angry or frustrated, well, if we know that we're feeling that, that knowing part of our mind is not in the feeling. It's like the observer and the observed, isn't it? The, the subjects and objects. So I think meditation is about uh, connecting with the backdrop, the awareness. Um, you know, in the book, I use a lot of imagery around the sky and clouds. So the, the metaphor there is that our mind is like the sky and then it contains lots of clouds. And so they can be light clouds, heavy clouds, whatever, but the sky is always bigger than the clouds. And in that sense, our mind is always bigger than our thoughts and emotions, because the, the part of us that sees how we're feeling is not in the feeling. Mm. And, and would you describe that as purely the mind that's having that experience? Because I'm, I'm always so fascinated in this and it, it can be it can become difficult when you start applying language to all of this as well, because everyone will have a, a, a different um, way of describing it or way of thinking about it. But of course, we're like, we know we have our physical body. We know we have our brain that's creating all of these thoughts. You know, what, what sort of language do you seem appropriate and uh, do you deem appropriate? And how do you describe that other part? You know, whether it is the awareness, the soul, what, what is that? I'm really interested in that bit of us at the moment and sort of, sort of looking at how we can look after that bit of ourselves rather than just mental health, physical health, what that other bit is. Yeah, I like the word awareness. I like the word consciousness. Uh, it, it's that, that part of ourself that experiences everything. We experience our life. We experience our, we experience our own bodies. We experience our own thoughts and emotions. And that experiencer, the observer, the, the part of ourself that, that is seeing and feeling and experiencing, that part is beyond the experience. It, so that part is freedom. That, that is where freedom is. And I think meditation is about connecting with that part. And for some people, it's a spiritual experience. For some people, it's not. I mean, it, meditation isn't, isn't only for people who are into Buddhism or spirituality. It's simply a experience of the mind and everyone has a mind so everyone can meditate. It feels like the bit of us that gets left behind or neglected somewhat because we, I think, you know, in everyday life in the modern world, we are perhaps encouraged or it's promoted to sort of, you know, be smart, be intelligent, look after your mind, or even with, you know, how mindfulness is talked about today and obviously to sort of look after your physical body. But that other bit kind of gets forgotten. And I think, you know, all of us, everyone listening to this, myself included, will have heard before um, conversation around the understanding that happiness has to come from within. Like we all kind of inherently know that, but we on a daily basis with every decision and choice we make choose to sort of forget that. And we're constantly looking for something else, for a quick fix or for validation outside of ourselves or for something that we can buy that's going to fill a hole. I mean, you use this excellent word to describe that which is grasping can, can you talk a little bit more around that for us yeah I mean we we are in a situation where we're constantly being told happiness will come from material objects and from situations around us and 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 that's been sort of manipulated within us all the time uh, we're, we're shown all these shiny objects and told if you have this then you'll be happy and so we spend loads of effort running after that thing. Yeah. We, we get that we might not get it or we might get that thing and then find that the wanting is still there. That, that grasping, that need for something is still there. We just move the goalposts to look for something else, something bigger or better. And so it, it never stops, does it? And that, that grasping is a sort of the, the mind's, uh, it, it's our mind's um, habit of always wanting something and always been pulled outside. I mean, one of the things about meditation is that you shift the focus from outside to inside. I don't mean you become kind of detached and cut off and kind of separate from reality. I just mean you start to pay more attention to your inner world and you start to look at the grasping itself. You know, instead of looking at the, the thing you're grasping at, you could look at the grasping 
the habit yes. that you have. And, and then you can start to change it and you can start to relax and find that the thing you wanted is actually already there within you. Yeah. Because happiness, happiness is a state of mind, isn't it? I mean, if you imagine when you get the thing you want, if you go down that road and you're, you're looking for happiness from a material object or a situation, okay, so you get that, but then what do you actually feel in that moment? You feel a sense of relief, you feel a sense of completion, you feel a sense of peace, joy, um, you feel fulfilled. Well, these are feelings. I mean, they're inside your own mind. So you could just cut out the middleman and go straight for the feeling. Yeah, and, and do you think we're, we're so bad at doing that? Because we're constantly told, again, probably due to advertising, that we do need fixing, that there's something wrong with us, that we are actually lacking and that they're going to be able to fix it for us. Whereas I don't think many of us grow up, you know, not, I'm not talking about childhood because most kids, you know, who are, who are lucky enough to have a sort of stable upbringing will just feel quite happy in the moment and be in the moment. But when we move into our teen years and, and our adulthood, that's when we start to actually believe, God, there is something wrong with me. I am lacking. There is some sort of distress and I need fixing. Somebody's got to fix me. And if we can sort of root back to, I'm already complete. I'm already okay. That's going to stop that cycle, that constant cycle of, of craving and wanting. Yeah, it's, it, it's very interesting. In, in the book, I, I give an example of a study that was done um, in a place called Ladakh, which is in the north of India. And this is a place that for, many, for centuries was kind of closed off to Western culture. It's a kind of small mountainous region. And in this study, it described how in the, in the 1980s, they kind of opened up and they started to have access to Western advertising. And the young people in the capital city started to try to make their skin whiter. They, they started to use kind of bleaching products on their skin for the first time ever, because they were seeing these huge billboards of adverts from the West with these very glamorized images of people who are supposedly happy, they've got it all, that's what you should aim for. It's blown up into a huge size, like a kind of God figure. And then these young people with these beautiful brown golden faces suddenly felt dissatisfied with how they looked and they thought, no, I need to be white. So I need to go and buy bleach and, and bleach my skin. I mean, they use this kind of face cream that made their skin lighter and this dissatisfaction starts to, to arise. And so that's a kind of um, a metaphor example for how we all live here in the West is that we're constantly shown imagery and information that makes us think there's something wrong with you. Mm. And until you, until you do what I'm telling you to do, I, the advertiser or whatever, I, I, the person selling you this thing, until you do this, you'll always feel there's something missing. Yeah, and it's almost hard to avoid at this point in time, you know, maybe not so much 10, 20 years ago, obviously advertising is, as always kind of, you know, well, in the last sort of 60, 70 years has been really potent. But in the last 10 years, we've also had social media to contend with as well. So, you know, it is everywhere. And also due to not only social media, but just how we communicate with each other, how we imbibe information via the news, newspapers, there's so many outlets now, whereas we were, we were sort of, you know, that, that was just reduced. We were starved of it to some extent back in the day, because we didn't have laptops, phones we carried around with us. We would make more of a choice as to I'm going to now read a newspaper or I'm going to turn the TV on. Now we feel like it's omnipresent. And mm. do you think that is possibly why the statistics for everything is just, you know, everything's up at the moment, anxiety, depression, OCD, any men mental health illness seems to just be pushed to its limits right now en masse because we can't escape that sort of mind trickery essentially. Yeah, I do think that's a contributing factor. And as you say, years and years ago, you you made a choice to find out what's going on in the news. And and that's an informed choice and it's a conscious choice. But now there's this sort of the way we've processed, the way we process information has completely changed. It's coming at us all the time. And the way that the news is monetized as well is a new thing in that the, the headlines will be written in a certain way that draws you in. And the easiest way to draw somebody in is to frighten them. 
Yeah. So you, you frighten people, you draw them in, they open the article, there's some ads in there. It, you, you click in there and you, you, you're caught. And so there's a monetization behind it. And obviously not all news is like that. And I hugely respect good journalism, of course, but there is an aspect to it where there's something underneath it that is manipulating us, isn't there? Without and as doubt. you say, yeah, and as you say, with social media, we're, we're, we've entered this reality where so much of our self-worth is based on likes and clicks and validation. And when many people, I mean, they go, you could go through life thinking, well, I don't know if I'm actually enjoying myself, so I better check if other people think I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, be I, better, I better photograph this experience and post it online to check if it's likable. Yeah. And if I get enough likes, then I, then I know I'm okay. God, so the, valid so <laughs> yeah. like, so the val validation's all given to others, isn't it? Like, Tubson, when you step back from it and when you unpick something like this, you know, it's, it's then, there's just the clarity where you go, this is lunacy. Like what we're living in at the moment is lunacy, not only because it exists, but because it's become completely normalized. You know, that's not, an, what you've just described there isn't extraordinary. It isn't for a few people out there. It's, it's for like 99% of people who have a phone will seek some sort of, even if it's on a very subconscious level, some sort of outside validation. And, and I've had sort of a great insight into this for my whole adult life because I, you know, started working in this weird industry as a child. So I was aware of that sort of dynamic, like, oh, other people can tell me if I'm doing okay en masse. And I've had to be very careful over the years looking at that you know how much weight can I put over there and how much can I own for myself and I think when you start to pick it all apart and also look at certainly with the news and advertising that we can follow most threads back and it, and it unfortunately is most threads back to money I think there's liberation in that because you go this is just a bit of a trick like I don't have to believe all this I can actually step back and I can choose to think this isn't actually real. I can, I can make a distinction between the sort of fantasy element or the sensationalized element and actually what deep, deep down I know to be true. And that's just maybe a case of sort of excavating all of the stuff we pile upon, you know, that knowing, I guess. I think so. And, and this, this world we're describing, I mean, you know, in one sense, it's horrific and, but, but we're, it's the, we're caught in it now. This is the way we function. This is, this is how we live and this is how we earn our money. And this is how society, the wheels of society turn. So, so I'm not suggesting we can just blow up the machine, No. but I, but I am suggesting that we we're in such an extreme situation that we, we now really need to, to do something as a matter of survival. We need to take better care of ourselves, better care of our mental health. And people are doing that. The conversation about mental health, the conversation about mindfulness and other things like that has really grown because that's, that's the healing that we can apply within this situation so that we can function within this really weird reality we're in but in a better way. And as you say, it's about stripping away all the extra stuff and finding out who you are. Well, who am I? I'm here in my room sitting here. Who am I? Who am I right now in this moment? I am alive. I'm breathing. I'm good. There's nothing wrong with me. I have a mind that has a deep well of possibilities, potential. We've all got incredible potential within us. We just forgot to look. We really have. And I, and I, I love, I love taking, a, taking a sort of step back in a moment to go, right, all these stories I've got in my head, what is true here? Like, is this, you know, I, I was thinking it just yesterday because my, my, my son who uh, is eight has, you know, trouble sleeping. And I often get into the negative cycle of going, there's something wrong with this situation. I'm doing something wrong. There's something wrong with the way that he's, you know, thinking about the world as he goes to sleep. And actually, like this has been going on over a year now. So my husband and I, you know, we talk a lot about all sorts of stuff. We're deeply curious about all elements of everything. And we've sort of just got to a place where we're accepting that this is just a phase that he's going through. 
and we don't need to fix him and we don't need to fix us. This is just something that we're going through. And I think often we are so quick and it's usually due to comparison, like, oh, my friend's kids are sleeping. Or if you put this into the context of work, achievement, whatever else people are using of, as markers to, to work out if they think they're OK, is because we're looking to everybody else rather than am I, do I need fixing or can I just be okay in all of this chaos that we're living through? I think so. And I think that for me, that's a really powerful definition of happiness is to be okay with, with not being okay. You know, it's, happiness isn't all about feeling great and having a good time. It's also about being able to just accept the darkness and the difficulty and the struggle and all, all the painful stuff, not, not to throw that away or hate that or reject that but just to to relax into it and I think that's a kind of compassion isn't it I think compassion yeah. I think love I think real love is where you can love whatever is happening right now in this moment e even the the difficult stuff and just to to relax into that and and to be with that without pushing it away to, to make friends with your experience whatever that experience is yeah well I think you know certainly if you've been through any tough moment in life that how you react to it really won't change what's going on it, it, I mean if in a negative sense if you're if you're sort of constantly um pushing against it trying to suppress it fighting against it that won't change the experience whereas if you choose to lean into it and you know this is something I've only been doing very very recently you know I I had much tougher times say a decade ago and I was just trying to suppress all of it and you realize it actually then just stretches the time out that you're dealing with all of those thoughts so I think you know maybe that is exactly where the freedom lies is in sort of the acceptance and the and the leaning into to difficult times rather than making it harder for, you, for yourself basically by sort of trying to squash everything down and and minimize it and um and get rid of it yeah i agree and in my own experience that's definitely true i um about 10 years ago i i was uh, doing a very very long retreat it finished in 2010 it was a four a four year long retreat um i described this in the book the book starts by describing how it felt to come out of that retreat and come back to london um so in that retreat of you know four years where you're completely enclosed in a retreat house, you're on a remote Scottish island, there's no contact with the outside world. It was a very terrifying experience, especially at first, because there's, there, there I am stuck with my own mind for all that time. And there were times when I couldn't even meditate. I was just so traumatized by the, the, the misery I found within myself. I went through extremely severe depression for the first part of that retreat. And what changed it for me was when I learned to do exactly what you were just describing, which is to stop hating myself for being depressed, mm. and to stop hating the depression, but to almost imagine the depression is a friend who's struggling. And would you, what would you do for that friend? You would sit with them and you would accept them how they are. You, you would just hold them and be, with, be there with them. So I, I learned how to do that for myself. I learned how to find the, the feelings within myself um, physically I mean I could feel the depression as a kind of sinking feeling in my heart or a, like like a sort of coldness inside I, just to feel that and love that and give that a huge amount of compassion and it started to change because I wasn't resisting and pushing and hating it's that it's like leaning in you lean into it and you know if you if you if you if you join together with the thing that hurts you, then it's not hurting you anymore because you and it are one. Mm. There isn't, this, this is hurting me. There's just an experience of peace and oneness. I love that. And strangely, I, I talked to Rhonda Byrne on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and she described such a, a similar experience. And it's definitely something I wish I'd known about 10 years ago. And I'm really fascinated with this retreat experience. And I loved reading about it in your book because again, the modern world promotes um, this sort of velocity that we're meant to keep up with. And with that, hand in hand comes the notion that if you're not enjoying something or something's not working for you, that you ditch it, you get out, you move on, you find something new, a new chapter. Whereas, you know, you stuck this out, you, you found, 
the piece in it by sticking with it for the full four years and patience isn't something that we particularly crave but it's such a beautiful quality to really understand and have what was it within you that that made you realize I, I can't give up even though I'm feeling this darkness and I'm and I'm struggling and I don't think I should be struggling what what really kept you in that space and kept you so you could get to that point that that switch point for you yeah, to be honest, I nearly, I very nearly did leave the retreat halfway through. I, I thought I can't take this anymore. It's, it's just, it, it's torture. But what kept me from leaving was knowing that, that I had to, I had to resolve this somehow, because it's the thing that had been tormenting me for years and years and years. I mean, it's why I became a monk in the first place. You know, I became a monk in my early 20s because of severe burnout, severe depression, panic attacks, anxiety. And then I became a monk and I think I probably suppressed all of it because I really got into being a monk and learning meditation and it's kind of new lifestyle. And, and then I started to teach meditation and um, be quite out there in the public. And maybe you kind of adopt a bit of a persona and you're not really looking at yourself. So then, you know, 12 years into being a monk, I went into this long retreat and it came up full force, all the stuff I'd been hiding from. That, that voice in my head that kept telling me I was no good, the sort of negative self-talk. And so I think what kept me going was I thought, well, if you, if you don't deal with this now, you're just gonna be going around in circles and you've got the tools, you're in a, a Buddhist retreat center, for goodness sake, you know, you've got all the tools with you. It's like you've got the medicine on the table. Are you going to take it or not? And I just knew that. I, I mean, I'd, I'd studied a lot about Buddhist philosophy, so I knew I knew what the teachings tell you, which is that acceptance and compassion are the only way forward. And so I thought, okay, I, I've got to apply this, and somehow I found a way. Maybe you hit rock bottom, and then that's the only way is to come up. So somehow I found a way to um, to to feel what I was feeling. With, with a sense of compassion, to give that part of myself acceptance, love and compassion. And the whole experience changed because up until that point, it felt like I was, it felt like I was inside some kind of torture chamber, being kind of tormented all the time by my own thoughts. And when I learned to lean into that and relax into that, it became like an experience, almost like being wrapped in a warm duvet. Mm. <laughs> you know, it became like a pleasant experience of, self-acceptance and yeah. it, ma it, it made me have much more of a gentle attitude towards my own mind and so now of course I still get upset and stressed and and all that stuff but I'm much more gentle with myself I don't I just I just accept how I feel and it kind of passes after a while well, that's it isn't it because you know that that just perfectly illustrates how we can have a really decent relationship with our thoughts and emotions and I think we're so quick in the modern world and and this is probably all due to advertising and social media and, and the lacking that we believe we might have or the fixing that we think we need is that as soon as we feel anything other than good we lump on self-loathing into the mix which just that's the bit that I feel traps us all is the sort of self-loathing bit um and I was so interested in in the book how you sort of teamed thinking in a, in a in a spiritual or an expansive way with essentially science because you, you talk about neuroplasticity and how we all have the capability to change our thought processes and change these neural pathways can you can you talk to us a little bit about that because I don't want to sit here and be like we need to sell meditation to the masses because people will, will do it or or not you know it's any you know, people will find it or, or or you know we don't need to do that but I think there are so many benefits and so many ways that we can really promote and talk about this subject matter with you know not only that sort of beautiful expansive thinking in mind but also scientifically what, what's happening in our brains yeah, I agree. I think that the scientific research that's gone into mindfulness and meditation has definitely made it more acceptable for people. And that's great. It's great that you can you can put somebody in a scanner and show that meditation has positively affected their brain. 
Mm. And then you can look at the readout, you can look at the diagram and you can show, yeah, they have a healthier brain. Just like if you take your, your body to a gym, you'll see muscle after a while. The same with the, with the mind. So I think that's really great. But, and, and then also you touched upon neuroplasticity. So even if you're not looking at scans and results and evidence and research, just the concept that we are, we are changeable, we, we can develop, we can train just knowing that is is really really a breakthrough because actually we're doing it all the time all the time throughout the day we are manipulating our own neuroplasticity usually in a way that isn't that helpful in that we we get into sort of old habits again and again and they just become stronger and stronger it's almost like we're training ourselves to be stressed we're training yeah. we're, we're training in self-loathing yeah we right? are we're, though aren't we but why the fact we can train in those things mean we can also train in things that help us. So we could train in peace, love, kindness, compassion, um, calm. We can train in all those things too. It's just where you put your training. So knowing that makes you want to meditate because then you see that, okay, I can, I can develop myself into a calm, positive person. And when I say calm, I don't mean like sort of tranquilized and zoned out like a zombie. I mean, literally to be at peace with yourself and at peace with the world and to be happy. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a trainable skill. And I think it's, it's something that people are more and more inspired to do. Yeah, but it's liberating, then, isn't it? It's liberating but, knowing that you aren't all these miserable thoughts and emotions. They're just a bad habit. And you, 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 you're more than you thought. You, you, you have more potential than you realized. And but then what I find is that is that when people start meditating, they often slightly go down a, a, a sort of like a rabbit hole and it makes it harder for themselves because what often happens is they have this idea that meditation means you're supposed to kind of go into a trance like state. Like clear your mind of all your thoughts and just kind of vanish and that is a huge rabbit hole to fall down because yeah. it's actually it's impossible and it's incredibly painful if you sit there trying to eradicate all your thoughts they just get stronger the more you tell your mind to shut up the loud, louder it shouts yeah yeah and then you think oh i'm a failure i can't meditate oh you know i'm not i'm not qualified for this because i've got a really busy mind it will never work for me but the whole problem is it's based on a misconception that people think meditation is about shutting down like switching off which is understandable because we're so stressed and so busy. We'd like a bit of shut eye, wouldn't we? We'd, li <laughs> we'd like to just kind of like- <laughs> Just switch remove, it off. Yeah, just switch it off. But, <laughs> but then, so what? You could, supposing you could just knock yourself unconscious for 10 minutes, you still got to wake up at the end of it and you're yes. back to square one. So as you said, it's about changing your relationship with your thoughts, it's not about getting rid of them. So it's about learning how to be less, enslaved by them so that you can start to be the boss of your own mind so when you're you know for, for anybody listening to this who has never tried meditation maybe feels a bit nervous too because they think it's not for them like you've just said i've, I've got a busy mind etc when you're in that meditative state or you're you're attempting to to try it out for the first time what are you likely to experience and what is I don't know if using the word aim is correct, but but what what is the experience that that would be um, beneficial to have that the capabilities to have neuroplasticity and, and to retrain our minds? Yeah, this is the thing. So so on paper, it sounds incredibly simple. You, you might be told a technique such as sit down and um, focus on your own breathing. I mean, that sounds incredibly simple. But the reality is it's really difficult because you manage about three breaths and then you're off, you know, three yeah. breaths and then you're off. You're thinking about shopping lists, emails, things you saw on TV. You get distracted by sounds. You think, why am I doing this? You start to have an existential existential crisis or then you think, have I fed the cats? You know, it's all over the place. isn't yeah. it? But that's the work and that's the beauty of it, because actually the whole point and this is back to neuroplasticity. The whole point of the training is to learn how, you know, your mind drifts, but then you bring it back. And it's actually the returning that counts, returning to the breath. That's what really counts. Because every time you, you, you know, you got caught up in your thoughts, every time you bring yourself back to the breath, 
it's like you're showing your mind who's boss. Mm. You're teaching yourself, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to buy into that thought. I can consciously move myself back to the breath. So it's almost like you're you're weakening the attachment that your mind has towards those thoughts, that addiction. You're, you're, you're curing yourself of the addiction. And so that if the coming back is what makes you stronger, you've got to have somewhere to come back from. So those thoughts that took you away are not a problem at all. In fact, they're part of the solution. And I find, I find that when people understand that, they stop beating themselves up when they meditate. They, don't, you know, they stop thinking, oh, my mind is so busy, I'm a failure. They, they see that the busy mind is precisely the thing that enables them to come back to the breath. So in a way, bring it on, bring on these thoughts. They, yeah, yeah, help, yeah. they help you, they help you to come back to, to your awareness. And this obviously takes um, you know, daily commitment or dedication. It's not like, you know, try this once a month and your life's gonna change. This is yeah. sort of something that needs to be incorporated because, you know, for, I, I, I still meditate infrequently and, you know, there are no excuses, I think, part of me reading your book and wanting to talk to you today is because I really want to you know get back to what I know really works for me because I've been sort of on off dipping in and out of meditation or really since I was a kid because my mum's been deeply fascinated with meditation and, and yoga and lots of other things um to sort of remedy a lot of the pain that she does still feel today and and she's she is perhaps grasping a little bit with some of it. And I don't think she'd mind me saying that because she kind of knows it. I think I, I obviously do it too. But she's, she's really, um, she's always encouraged me to sort of look to, to these sorts of practices to find some sort of peace. And I really want to get back to it. And I think what I realise when I do come back to it is that my attachment to negative feelings is so much stronger. And the stories, the negative stories that I carry around with me feel so true, like so factual. I find it really hard to, to come back to the breath because they're so overwhelming. And I think there'll be so many people out there who will have had something awful happen to them. Um, they might have lost their job, lost the loved one. Maybe they've been told, I think this is the tricky one as well. Maybe they've been told by a person or lots of other people that they're useless, bad, no good at something. And I think it's perhaps difficult when you're trying to come back to the breath to really remember that that doesn't have to all be true. It feels so true. And I just wonder if the way out of that is to just make it a daily discipline and that those feelings and that attachment dissipate over time. I think so. I think it's, it is about making it a daily practice, but there are some tricks you can apply that help that to be easier. Like one thing is not to try and do big, long sessions, but just to, to start with 10 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day is very doable. And then, and then the other thing is it's not only about, sitting down on a chair or a cushion and meditating. It's also about those tiny moments throughout the day. Um, I, I talk about this a lot in the book about how mindfulness in daily life is the key. You can be standing in the queue at the supermarket and you can feel the ground under your feet just for a few seconds. You can be stuck in traffic. You can be washing your hands. You can be brushing your teeth. You can have these mindful moments. And that doesn't feel like a big time commitment because you're just adding mindfulness to the mix of what you're already doing but then also it's not always about the breath like you described sometimes we have these often we have these really difficult painful feelings and then there's a whole story behind those feelings and I think sometimes it's about feeling the feeling without the story so, like so, so when I was in my retreat I, I wasn't using the breath at all. In fact, I, I was there with this horrific sadness inside me. And I used that as the meditation because my mind was kind of flipping off into all the stories about why I was sad. Huge, long stories, which are valid. I'm not suggesting that it's all just rubbish. It's valid. But in terms of meditation, if you drop the storyline and go straight to the feeling, you can find freedom. Yes. That is it. I'm thinking of a particular situation in my own life. You know, we're all going through stuff constantly, aren't we? Of course. And it's a particular situation. And if I actually eradicate the story, 
from this setup and I just think about the emotion there's probably a little tiny bit of anger but probably mostly sadness and I think if we go back we you know we rewind back about 15 minutes into this conversation and then I can look at oh well how could I lean into that that's the sweet spot there and I think you know I just forget that it is I just forget it yeah and and I, I find the, the easiest way for me to do it is to is to find physically where I feel it in my body yeah so if it's an anger maybe I feel like a, a burning inside my chest or, or if it's a sadness maybe it's a sinking feeling but there's a kind of physical residue of the emotion isn't there there's a, a physical feeling and so what I try to do is is just drop the stories and feel the feeling in my body and use that as meditation just focus on that without trying to push it away without trying to justify it without trying to analyze it just it is what it is mm. and I'm there with it and because I'm now relaxing into it with kindness you're forgiving yourself for how you feel and the feeling starts to change because you're no longer strangling it with all the stories or pushing it down or telling it it's bad you're, you're allowing it you're allowing it this is you you are you are you in this moment feeling what you're feeling and that's fine you're allowing yeah. yourself that's self-compassion right there isn't it that's yeah. I think dropping the story, you know, gives room for a bit of self-compassion. I can see that in my own life. Like if I get rid of the story, I, I feel so much more empathy and just connection to those feelings. And I stop the sort of constant um, habit, again, of beating myself up about stuff. It's, that is liberation in itself. Um, you know, we haven't even touched on your, your amazing life story. And, and I'd, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions about that you know sure. how because I think a lot you know you talked about burnout a moment ago and on mass we're feeling burnout right now you know we've oh, done yeah. like a year of this resilience now and, and and everybody you know there's obviously varying degrees due to circumstance or whatever but we've all had to have a, a sort of shield of, of resilience up and we've had to really work through a lot of inner stuff because we're much less distracted than normal and I think we're all a bit worn out, like mentally, physically, you know, sometimes I do moan about this a bit too much, but I'm, you know, doing what many are, which is juggling homeschool with, with work. And you do sort of physically feel slightly beaten by the relentlessness of everything without, without any let up. And your reaction to having burnout whilst you were living in New York, acting, making music, like you said, with ambition and money and, and all of that stuff, what what kind of happened to, to create that catalyst to go, to go from burnout to to choosing this this committed life of being a monk well i i got incredibly sick and very very suddenly i literally woke up in my apartment in brooklyn one morning having all the symptoms of a heart attack and i was terrified and i went to doctors and they said uh we don't know what's wrong with you but uh it's probably stress, it's probably your excessive lifestyle. I was partying all the time. I was uh, taking loads of substances and just not looking after myself. And so it was a complete crash, complete collapse. And I was ill for a while. I was ill for a few months. Um, and I thought, I've, re I've really blown it. I've really, I've hit rock bottom. What, what am I gonna do? And my mother was looking after me at the time. She, she was living in the States at that time and I, went to her place, she looked after me. She had all these books about meditation um, because meditation and Buddhism had already always been there in the background as I grew up, but I'd never taken it very seriously. But all these books were there. I'm desperate, I'm reading these books. And these books are telling me, you, can, you, you, are, you are okay, there's nothing wrong with you. You've just got caught up in your stress. You don't realize that your mind has incredible potential. So this message really started to grab me and I, I wanted to learn meditation. And then an old school friend of mine told me that there's a Buddhist monastery in Scotland where at that time they'd started a thing where you could be a monk for a year, like a one, uh, just a one year thing where you go. And I went there, I, I said, I'm, I'm going, she was going, I said, I'm coming with you. And I went there and it was full of young people like myself, people who kind of burned out on the rave scene or people who'd had some kind of crisis and then there were also people who hadn't had some big tragedy. They were just kind of seeking, but a lot of, a lot of young people, I think 40 or 50 of us all 
took robes at the same time, we became monks and nuns. And it was going to be just for a year. And for many people it was, but for me it lasted longer because at the end of that year, I, I got really into it. I, I, I thought I'm going to stay longer. I'm going to do another year. And then in my second year, I went into retreat for nine months. And in that nine month long retreat, I started to really think about my life. Like, who am I? What am I? What am I doing? Do I want to just go back to, to the States and carry on with my so-called career? Is that really making me happy? What is it that got me here is, is horrific amounts of stress. Maybe I've been living just for, for my ego all this time. Maybe it's just been so much about me. What would it be like to live with compassion? What would it be like to help others? I started to ask these questions. And for me, the choice was to stay a monk. So I, eventually I took lifelong vows. And now I've been a monk for what, 20, 27 years. And it's, be, it's become something that I never ever would have dreamt I would be a monk. I was so not a monk type of person. <laughs> You know, all my friends from the old days were saying, oh my goodness, he's joined a cult. We're gonna to have to rescue him. What's happened to him? He's taken LSD and gone mad. What's going on? <laughs> we have to go and get him. But, but somehow, I don't know, sometimes extreme people go from one extreme to the other. Yeah. But, <laughs> but somehow this, this isn't too extreme for me because actually you might think being a monk is extreme. You give up so much, but you actually gain much more than you give up yeah that's and just so, the, the myth of the modern world telling you you're giving up stuff really isn't it well yeah what am i giving up i'm giving up things that made me suffer anyway and i'm 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 really i i love being a monk and i love the fact that it's given me a platform from which i can communicate a positive message and i can use my own history of of depression and anxiety and addiction and all of that i can now go into drug rehab centers i can go into prisons hospitals help people with what I've learned and I'm still learning. So it's very fulfilling. So, so fulfilling and, and, and incredible. And something just really jumped out at me when you were talking there. And that is the word retreat. Cause we've all, you know, we've all heard the word retreat talked about in, in lots of different ways in the sense that, that you're using it in a kind of, I'm going on a spa retreat. Yeah. But actually when we think about the real meaning of the word, like to retreat, from life sometimes that could be seen as a negative like you're retreating from it you're not dealing with it but there's so much to be gained from physically retreating from all of this noise and, and craziness you know you, you've you've made that active choice to so you can go inwards and to look at the stuff that that you want to, to heal or have acceptance around what can we on an everyday level learn from retreat you know is there a time when retreating is negative and we're not dealing with stuff or is it always a, a, a positive thing to do well it depends what you're doing with your mind at the time and when I went into retreat may, maybe some people thought or said in fact oh you're, you're running away from life but the whole point is I was going deeper I was going into an enclosed space to look at my mind and heal stuff because the whole point of retreat is to then come out of retreat at the end with a new perspective and re-engage with the world and I mean now I'm very much in the world I'm very busy I'm just as busy and stressed as everybody else but I've got tools which help me navigate that stuff because of retreat and I think lockdown can be retreat I mean people yeah. pay loads of money to go on retreats we've got a government enforced retreat now so let's <laughs> use it you know because it, as you said it's a time of healing it's a time of, of introspection and yes, of course, we're all desperate to get, get out of lockdown and get on with our lives. But I'm sure when we look back, there's going to be a feeling of, wow, we went through that. That year was horrible, but also amazing. And we learned so much and we got closer to our families and we got closer to ourselves and something came out of it. Some kind of, I don't know, some kind of spiritual development can come out of being alone with yourself. Yeah, oh, so, so retreat can be anything I mean that you know I've done long retreats I've also done short retreats even a day a weekend you know, what why not take some time out even half a day a day where you just shut the phone off and you just meditate all day not like const constantly but sessions all day it means that you're giving yourself an environment through which you can go really deep and then when you come out of that you've learned something we're scared to, aren't we? We're scared to um, step off the 
the roundabout. Oh, it's the terrifying, terrorism. terrifying. I mean, when I went into that four year retreat, I was terrified because I all, all it's a bit like lockdown. All the things that you use for your survival and happiness and joy are all taken away from you and you're just going to be with yourself. And I didn't like myself. The thought of locking myself in a room with me was horrific because I didn't like myself. Why would I want to spend time with somebody I didn't like? And so the only way forward was to learn to like myself. And that's what that experience of going through the depression and leaning into it really taught me is that you can make friends with yourself and be at peace with your own company. And I think if you do that, it can help your relationships with others as well, because somebody who doesn't like themselves can't really like anybody else, or, or they pretend to like other people, hoping they'll like them back. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if, if you learn to, to, to enjoy your own company, you can really be there for others. That compassion can spread and become something that can heal the society around us. You know what, I did a, an Instagram live chat the other day with this amazing new friend of mine, really. I've, I've made a lot of new friends in the last 12 months, having not met any of them face to face, but just people that I've, I've met online. And this um, great guy called John O'Lancaster, um, who has Treacher Collins syndrome. And he has this beautiful Instagram page where he talks about self-love, acceptance and compassion daily. And it's it's really an amazing page to land on and to like hear him talk and to watch his videos. And the most interesting thing when I was talking to Jono, who, who is an amazing place of, of you know, just self-acceptance and self-compassion, the amount of people that were commenting afterwards saying, I hate myself, I hate myself, I'm not a good person. I, I was actually shocked. And, you know, I shouldn't be really, because I've felt like that many times over my lifetime. But I think it was just the sheer volume of, of comments like that. And um, I think for a lot of the people that were making those comments, they really do feel, again, going back to our earlier chat, trapped in it. Like there is no way out of that because they just are a bad person. They have made mistakes. They have made bad choices. What would you say to somebody who's feeling like that at the moment? I think we've got to realise it's not our fault. We're in, we're in a very toxic environment that constantly tells us there's something wrong with us. We're always told you're not this enough, you're not that enough, you'll only be happy if you lose weight or if you look like this celebrity or that, or you'll only be happy if, when or because. We're constantly being brainwashed negatively. So we need to give ourselves a hug and say, look, it's not your fault. You're in a very difficult environment. And so then you don't have to start blaming others and saying, right, society's crap. I want to I want to just blow it all up. No, you, you can just know that that you have, you've got yourself into this state through a lot of conditioning, a lot of um, external factors, internal factors, whatever, but you can change and you can start to, okay, well, meditation is, is an amazing healing for that because those voices in your head that tell you you're no good, they are just thoughts. They're just very loud thoughts and meditation helps you to believe those thoughts less, to give them less power and instead to connect with your inner goodness, your inner potential for peace, happiness, and goodness. You're, you're connecting with the sky instead of the clouds. You're, you're, you're realizing that you're bigger than your self-hatred. Like supposing I've got a pain in my foot or a headache. That's not the whole of me. I've got a headache, but mm. other bits of, so, so okay, I've got a bit of self-hatred going on in the side, but there's more to me than that. And meditation helps you connect with the more rather than the less. Mm. God, that's real food for thought. Um, yeah, we, we just get in such a mess with all of this, don't we? And, and like you say, it's not our fault. It, this is a really hard environment to live in for everyone. You know, things are really complex with technology and news and the bombardment of that and how we communicate with each other. You know, even outside of a pandemic, that's confusing. So... I think that's a really lovely takeaway and again it just all leads back to that self-compassion doesn't it and that that self-love and, and being kinder to ourselves that's just so, and, you know meditating is a nice way of doing that a little gift to yourself like having that moment with yourself yeah and it can just be moments as well of course it's great to sit down and do formal meditation but some people find that so difficult so why not just wash your hands mindfully or chop the vegetables mindfully? Have that moment of peace. Because normally when you're washing your hands or chopping the vegetables or ironing or walking somewhere, normally our head is somewhere else totally caught up in all the stress. So what about just walking? 
or just ironing or just washing the hands, meaning bringing your mind to where your body is and being with the moment, that is compassion because you're, you're giving yourself peace. Mm. You're giving yourself a break. We all need that at the moment, don't we? We all need that. I think you know, that micro, micro mindfulness that you're talking about is something that we can all definitely go away and practice immediately and, you know, experiment, see how that feels and, and go with it. I'm, I'm certainly going to walk away and, and do that today and for the rest of lockdown, for the rest of my life, I'm going to create these little micro moments for sure. Um, God, I mean, I could literally talk to you for about a year and I'd still have a, a, you know, a bag full of questions to ask you, but we've, we've done a whole hour, which has whizzed by so quickly. Um, thank you so much, Tubton, for, for such wisdom and, um, and your thoughtfulness around, you know, what you're offering to the Happy Place listeners. I think it's, it's amazing and, and I've so enjoyed chatting to you today. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it too. It's been a great conversation and I, I've really enjoyed your, your points and your questions and your perspective on things as well. Thank you. Thank you.